There's old games and new games and even a bear. Uh -huh. 2022 started out as the greatest year for video games since 2017 and then kind of just tapered off near the end, at least for me. There were a number of things that were supposed to come out this year that didn't actually come to fruition, chiefly the Mario movie and Tears of the Kingdom. I was looking forward to these things a lot, so seeing them get delayed for the 87th time in a row was kind of sad. But reflecting on last year, I actually think it was pretty good. I played way more games this year than previous years. I'm still weeding through my backlog and going out of my comfort zone. So before I list the big stuff, let's talk about the honorable and dishonorable mentions. First of all, I finally beat Sticker Star. This is the best Paper Mario game. As a Paper Mario fan, I hate it when the game I'm playing has fun gameplay and engaging plot and lovable fleshed out characters. And that is why I love Sticker Star so much, because it has none of those things. Pokemon. I don't play Pokemon. The Last of Us Part 1 is perhaps the most unnecessary video game product since the NES Speedboard. This is a game that not only already looked great and played well even by today's standards, but was already available on the PS5 because it's fully compatible with the PS4 version, which was already a remake of the original game for the PS3. The remastered visuals are spectacular, but, I mean, at this point, the game is like the modern version of Mario and Duck Shoot for the NES, in that if you have a PlayStation, you probably own this game, and if you think you don't, you're probably wrong. It's not so much that the remake was excessive that bugged me, it's more so that there are tons of other games that could have benefited far more from a re-release that aren't getting one. By the time Nintendo re-releases Thousand Year Door or Konami re-releases Guns of the Patriots, there's gonna be Last of Us Part 1 remastered, reloaded, and retoasted for the PlayStation 9. But don't worry, cause it gets even better. Because according to rumors, they are also remastering, and I'm not kidding you in the slightest, they are remastering Horizon Zero Dawn. You know, that game that came out the same year as Mario Odyssey, that is fully playable on the PS5, and is also on Steam for the PC. I think for me though, the most disappointing game this year by far was Saints Row. This game wasn't good, it wasn't even okay. I already expected not very much from this game and I was still let down. The devs said they were aiming for a balance of serious and comedic like Saints Row 2, but in reality it was more like cyberpunk but without the redeeming qualities. It's Saints Row. But no Dildo Bat, no Johnny Gat, no funny British voice, and it doesn't even really feel like a gangster game, so pretty much all of the stuff that made Saints Row cool and unique, that's gone. And you're left with the most aggressively pedestrian open world game that feels like it was written by an artificial intelligence that learned to speak English by watching BuzzFeed videos from 2015. I actually felt bad when I finished this game. I spent 90 Canadian on it after tax and I can't remember the last time I pissed away that much money on something that wasn't worth it at all. What's funny about comparing this game to Cyberpunk is that Cyberpunk actually had a redemption arc this year, where the game is now in a far more functional state, so more people can finally appreciate its beautiful world and story, and sniper rifle that can pass through 87 feet of reinforced concrete. Not to mention the upcoming Phantom Liberty expansion and Edge Runners, which is the greatest thing Netflix has ever accomplished since publishing The Irishman. But hey. At least Saints Row has waffles. CD Projekt also hit The Witcher 3 with a graphical upgrade. Didn't really need an upgrade, much like The Last of Us, it was already a spectacular looking game even 7 years later, so this was definitely excessive, and it would have been nice if my computer could run it without catching fire, but they did provide it for free, which already makes it better than Last of Us. Now to be clear, I still do not like this game, but maybe I'll like The Witcher 4, we'll just have to wait and see. High on Life had some annoying glitches, but thankfully Justin Roiland clarified that the glitches are actually a satire of glitches, so it's all good. I ended up liking this game more than I expected to. The gameplay is nothing phenomenal, but the world and the atmosphere and the psychic pebbles makes it feel fresh and different, like something I haven't seen before a billion times. A lot of the dialogue is very Justin Roiland, which is not a compliment. But I mean, you know, still better than Saints Row. We killed this kid. Are, are you happy now? We killed a kid. A kid is dead now. There goes our E for everybody rating. Shut the fuck up! 
I went back and beat GTA 3 for the first time. This game is very wonky, but I really appreciated the freedom and liberty in the game's design. I also finally played Bloodborne, whose custom character creator is somehow funnier than Saints Row. Duke Nukem Forever finally came out, but not the actual Duke Nukem Forever, the good one that was never finished. And then, just a few days ago, Duke Nukem Reloaded got leaked too. And then, they leaked Duke Nukem Critical Mass for the PSP. Then they leaked a prototype of Duke Nukem Zero Hour for the N64. And then they leaked a pitch for a fucking Duke Nukem movie. Somebody call this man a plumber because his unfinished refuse is just spraying all over the place this year. To sum up my taste in video games, just understand that I consider these leaks to be some of the most exciting things in gaming in recent memory. Maybe one of these days we can get Mother 64 or the beta build of Banjo-Kazooie. Hell, I'd even take Conquer 12 Tales. But we also got a huge leak of very early GTA 6 footage, which was very exciting. The good news is that the game does exist and it is being worked on. The bad news is they might have to push it back to 2035 because the source code was compromised. And the other, other big news is that Donkey is now producing video games. Yes, Donkey. There's no Knack 2, there's no spaghetti and meatballs, there's no not even close baby, there is no punchline, it's not a joke. This is actually happening. I cannot wait to see what comes out of this. If it succeeds, then we'll get some good games, and if it doesn't, well, we'll get a good story. Anybody who's watched me for a long time knows that I am infamous for arriving late to the party. Left 4 Dead is a game that I remember a lot of people playing in high school, and as a Nintendo boy at the time, I didn't really get it. Jump to today, the game is $10 on Steam, you know, one person can buy it for three of their friends for half the price of a single copy of Back 4 Blood, and they can just get on there and have a blast. Let him in! <laughs> no, let him in! Stop! <laughs> No, it's Brother, okay. walk I'll in. Throw myself to the horde. No! <laughs> Alright, get in here. Alright. What the f- Let me in! There's a surprising element of cooperation and communication going on in this game. Me and the boys would just go in there and go nuts and get killed a million times, and sometimes we'd just start messing with each other because it was fun. Before we carry on with that fun discussion, you're in NPC, you just healed Zoe. <laughs> but eventually, we all click and realize what's going on, and we just blow through the game like a squad of super soldiers. Stray is like an art house version of Ratchet and Clank. It was a little game made by a company I never heard of before, and it was nominated for Game of the Year next to things like God of War. It's a game that I gambled on, and for my money, it was worth it. It is a very beautiful, very visual game about a cat that gets lost in an underground society of robots. The visuals and settings are very evocative and beautiful. The only things I found disappointing were the gameplay, which was far more streamlined and prohibitive than I was expecting, and for a game that is otherwise very visual, there is a little too much reliance on heavy-handed dialogue, but if you can look past the little mistakes, you'll experience the greatest cat-based video game since the Bubsy remaster. Not to mention the sound design, which is incredible. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto 4 is a game that I played all the way through at least four times in my life, but the reason it's on my list this year is purely for the story DLC, which I have neglected to play until now. Ballad of Gay Tony and The Lost and the Damned. Rockstar, take notes from yourself 14 years ago. This is how you do a fucking DLC. Not this. This. Not this. Winner. Loser. Instead of charging hundreds of dollars for in-game currency to spend on a shitty car, you get two entirely fully fleshed out GTA side stories from two very different perspectives. I'd say this isn't just good DLC, but it's absolutely necessary to fully appreciate GTA 4 narratively because of how tonally different either chapter is, and how many new things you learn about the characters in the world. Ray Bulgarin, this evil bastard who tracks Nico halfway across the ocean? In Gay Tony, we learn that he's a dork who spends his free time playing the guitar really badly. It's kinda like Pulp Fiction, where you see the exact same story from more than one perspective. It's an approach to storytelling that I would love to see from GTA 6. By now you all know how I feel about Saints Row. But you know what game is better than Saints Row? Saints Row. Better version. Volition? Take notes. From yourself. 14 years ago. This is how you do a Saints Row. Not this. This. 
Not this. The one silver lining of the new Saints Row is that it inspired me to finally go and finish all the other Saints Rows, and Saints Row 2 is definitely the best one. It's goofy without feeling forced, and it's gritty without overtaking the goofiness. Saints Row 2 is what Saints Row should have been. I feel like for my entire life, everyone was talking about how great Tony Hawk's Ho Haters was, and I sat on that for 20 years. I finally went and played these old classics, and even on the old school PS1, it is a lot of fun, even today, perhaps especially today. It's the kind of game that is often neglected in the current generations. Yeah, the graphics were probably awesome when it came out, but you don't play for the graphics, you play cause it's fun. Just skateboard shit and collect VHS tapes. That's what video games are all about. When I was a little kid, the best first person shooter ever made was Halo. Jump to today, the best FPS game ever made is still Doom Eternal, but Halo was really good too. I went and played through the campaign on Legendary Difficulty and after 500,000 deaths and 7 brain tumors, I reigned supreme. The campaign for this game is still incredibly spontaneous 20 years later. Shootouts are very open to improvisation. Gun emplacements, all enemies drop weapons, melee, stealth, warthogs, banshees, wide, sprawling levels that are actually fun to fight enemies in, and a level of polish that even many games today can only dream of having. This game was so far ahead of its time that it feels like it came out last Tuesday. Twenty twenty two was the year that I finally got around to beating Bioshock. This is one of the landmark titles in video game stories and world building. The city of Rapture is one of the most beautiful, evocative, broken worlds that I have ever seen in a video game to this day. The only thing that's kind of weak is the gameplay, which, although brilliant at times, can feel a little unpolished and not super refined, but the true star of the show is the presentation. It's one of the most frequently cited examples of video games as an art medium, and for good reason. It's a story about the fallibility of the human species. Their boundless, selfish pursuits eventually become their undoing as they create more enemies. Manipulation, backstabbing, lying, a world of exceptional brilliance uninhibited by regular regulatory bodies and it all comes crashing down because even the best of us just can't help but bring about our own destruction in one way or another. Also there's an upgrade where hitting people with the wrench gets your health back and that's really funny. Mario! I remember when Super Mario 3D World first came out, I pretty much just completely ignored it. This was Mario's big jump to HD and it was a direct sequel to a handheld 3DS game. Fast forward a couple of years, I start seeing people like Scott the Waz and Nathaniel Bandy say shit like, Ah man, this is one of the best Mario games ever created, and I was like, Huh? Today, I can much better appreciate this game for what it is. It doesn't have the insane Olympic gymnastics of Mario 64 or the exploration and naturalistic environments of Mario Sunshine, but it takes a different approach to the Mario formula by shifting its focus away from Mario's mobility towards the insane level designs hitting you with one new mechanic after another. I still maintain that this is not my first, second, or even third favorite 3D Mario game, so the fact that it's number 4 on this list should tell you everything. Mario is the man, he will always be the man, and he will always be number 4 on this list. <laughs> Doom Eternal, maybe you heard of it. It was the winner of zero awards at the Game Awards in 2020. But what if I said Doom Eternal, the rhythm game? Yeah, now you're gonna give it some awards, aren't ya? And the Game Award for Best Score and Music goes to... God of War Ragnarok! Kill yourself. Metal Hellsinger is a game that I was initially intimidated by. It's a metal-inspired, rhythm-based FPS, and I was like, how the hell does that work? But then I actually played it. I gotcha, I know what you're saying, I catch your drift, I, uh, I, I understand. Shoot, dash, shoot, dash, kick, ass, great, game, hell, yeah, good, shit, buy it, on, Steam. I feel like Kirby in the Forgotten Land is a game that should have come out 300 years ago. 
Kirby has had a very consistent and comfortable place in 2D, but Mario went 3D 26 years ago, Zelda went 24 years ago, DK 23 years, and somehow for that entire time, Kirby has stayed landlocked in 2D until 2022. This game has felt like an inevitability and yet I was completely surprised when it was announced and I am so happy we finally reached the end of that long tunnel. I'm talking beautiful environments, I'm talking great music, and I'm talking fun power-ups. In Kirby's brand new 3D adventure, you become a vending machine to fight 700 secret final bosses. Also, I'm 20% sure Donkey somehow stumbled upon my review of the game by some freak accident and borrowed some of my observations for his video that came out a couple days later. Now, I cannot prove that, but... I mean, what I'm saying is Kirby is basically just Elden Ring. That is because Kirby is actually Elden Ring. They gave DDD the Horfrost Stomp. I mean, literally just straight up the Horfrost Stomp. DDD even has the same exact move as Radagon, where he slams the ground. Let me sum up my experience with Elden Ring by telling you about this one single boss fight. This is the Fire Giant. He can slam you like this, he can roll around like this, he can do all this insane bullshit, and on top of that, he sends these fireballs after you to completely throw your movement options into the garbage bin. And if that's not enough, he has the biggest fucking health bar in the seven seas. After 87 failed attempts to kill this guy, I consulted Google and discovered this really great cheese strat where you can trick him into waltzing off this cliff, which breaks his legs and does half his health bar, and I was so relieved, but after trying to do it three times in a row, I discovered that they patched it out, and once I made that realization, I was ready to quit the entire game. But instead, I chose to keep fighting him, and on my 89th attempt, I was completely at the end of my rope. We were both down to our last bit of health. Torrent was dead. All of my flasks were empty. I had to fight him head on. So much adrenaline, so much intense fucking primal caveman energy flooding through my entire body, and since it's a Souls game, I couldn't even pause to catch my breath. One slightly wrong move could throw this entire fight in the garbage bin and- Once I heard that sound, I was in shock. I almost couldn't process it. I lifted my hands from the desk, shaking profusely. I stood up out of my chair and completely collapsed into the wall. Never, and I do mean never, has a boss fight in a video game elicited a reaction of this magnitude. I have played plenty of games that pissed me off, but usually once I get over that obstacle, I take a deep breath and move on. This was not like that at all. I thought I might need to go to the hospital. And you know what's fucked up? That's not even the hardest boss in the game. Godskin Apostle, this guy's a dick. Godskin Noble, this guy's a bastard. So naturally, when you start reaching the end game, the game goes, <laughs> remember this guy? And remember this other guy? Now you have to fight both of them at the same time. Fuck off. Elden Ring has some of the most insane, maldingly infuriating boss fights I have ever been a witness to, but that only serves to make it feel like an actual accomplishment when you beat them. But it's also the first open world game since Breath of the Wild where the developers actually tried to make it fun. This is not a heavy-handedly narrative-driven game with an excess of cutscenes and dialogue trees, but the setting is so rich, so evocative, and so magnificently brought to life that you can get lost in it for hours, stumbling upon secret after secret after secret. It doesn't have 17 octodecillion polygons per second or 22 zetaflop GPU gay tracing, but instead relies heavily on somber, beautiful art direction which is somehow way more powerful. Games this big often feel sparse and thin, but Elden Ring manages to remain exciting forever because the core gameplay is actually engaging and the sense of discovery is remarkable. And it really does earn your trust that your time and effort will be rewarded, which is a remarkable achievement because the game is often so punishing otherwise. And on top of all of this, the world itself tells a rich, evocative story with very little 
subliminal dialogue at all. When I review a game, basically I record an entire playthrough of it and store it on a hard drive so I never lose the footage. I collected over 100 hours of footage of this game, totaling almost 2 terabytes. That is more than any game I have ever played. Elden Ring is amazing to such a degree that I didn't think game developers were even capable of anymore. This game truly is a masterpiece, it deserved to win Game of the Year, just like Bill Clinton, and I pity any motherfucker who even thinks about trying to one-up this studio. This game is so good that it turned me into the one thing I never thought I would be. A Soulsborne fan. Happy New Year! I have become the monster. <laughs>